So, uh, hello. So uh, recently it occurs to me that uh, the notions of telicity or atelicity could be interesting notions to distinguish between different kinds of AI. So I wanted to uh, present, to discuss these notions with you and know what you think. <clears throat> so I will first give a definition. So the terms telic and atelic, they are not uh, jargon. They are usual words that you can find a definition in any dictionary. You probably have heard of them before. Uh, it's usually used in linguistics. So a telic activity, uh, it comes from the ancient Greek telos, which means goal. So a telic activity is an activity oriented toward completion of a goal. And it stops when the goal is reached. So we could call it a hard goal. It's a specific state of the world that we want to reach. An example telic statement in linguistic would be John built a house. So when the house is built, the goal is reached, the activity stops. It's a telic statement. Uh, on the contrary, an atelic activity is a non-completable activity. There is no completion criteria. Uh, the activity stops for reasons external to the activity itself. So uh, when we think of it, we could consider that this activity has a goal. So for example, playing music, there is no a concrete goal to reach, but we have some purpose, if you will, but we call it a soft goal as opposed to a hard goal. And an example atelic statement would be John built houses. What I am saying here, is John is a house builder, but I'm not saying that he's actually completing the building of a house. So uh, in some activities, it could be pretty clear, the distinction. So if I am playing chess or go, uh, my goal is to win the game, so it's clearly a telic activity. In some other activities, uh, so for example, if I am playing music, it's clearly an atelic activity. I am not doing it to reach the final note. But there are some activities in between that are not so clear. So for example, if I'm saying I'm cleaning my house, I could clean it to reach a state in which my house is very clean and I am done. Or I could be just performing uh, routine tasks to clean my house. And if you see me clean my, cleaning my house, you don't know if I am doing it in a telic approach, if I try to reach this state of my house is clean, or if I am just doing it in an atelic way, just performing those uh, routine uh, process. So in fact, it depends on the algorithm that I am using when I am cleaning my house. So I think it makes sense to talk about telic algorithms and atelic algorithms. So let's see how, how it could apply to algorithms. So uh, when we are doing problem solving on graph exploration, it's clearly telic. Uh, we have this, uh, I have this quote from Newell and Simon, famous paper on symbol and search. A physical symbol system exercises its intelligence in problem solving by search. That is by generating and progressively modifying symbol structure until it produces a solution structure. So when I get the solution structure, I reach my goal. So it's clearly a telic activity. And if I am doing a graph search, I start in a specific state, and I'm exploring a graph until I find a goal state. So I need some criteria to decide that I have reached the goal. And when I have reached the goal, it stops. So it's clearly a telic activity, a telic algorithm, I mean. When we are doing reinforcement learning, it can be more uh, tricky. So in uh, Sutton and Barto's famous foundational books on reinforcement learning, we have this sentence, the agent must have a goal or goals relating to the state of the environment. The formulation of reinforcement learning is intended to include just these three aspects, sensation, action, and goal. So in this case, I would say it's telic. So a, a, a classical implementation of reinforcement learning is a partially observable uh, Markov decision process in which the system is modeled as a set of states uh, the agent uh, has an receives an observation of the partial observation of the state. The agent chooses an action, it changes the state, and it receives a reward from the uh, state. So when I design my agent, 
I decide which state will be the goal state, and I design the reward function to give a reward when the, reach, when the goal state is reached, so my agent will learn to reach this goal state. So it's clearly telic. But then some other authors have uh, suggested that we should try to make systems that learn atelic activity. So uh, typically in the domain of developmental AI or incremental learning or uh, lifelong learning. So there is this figure in uh, Guerin, Kruger, and Kraft paper, this conceptualization of developmental learning in which the agent over time learns patterns of behavior that stack up more and more complex, sophisticated patterns of behavior without trying to reach a predefined goal. And at the same time, it constructs this kind of representation in terms of patterns of behavior, so in terms of affordances. And maybe within this representation, it can choose a goal to reach and plan to reach this goal, but it is not defined from the beginning. The agent chooses it, its own goal in terms of its own representation constructed from its experience of interaction. So that would be, for me, a typical atelic learning algorithms. But of course, we don't know how to do that. There is, no, but no, <laughs> there is no solution to do that. If you know how to achieve this kind of learning, please let me know. But uh, we could nonetheless work on uh, basic atelic tasks. So we try to think about the simplest atelic task that we could think. So uh, we have one bit of possible actions. The agent could choose this or this. And one bit of possible feedback. So the agent chooses this, it gets this feedback or this feedback, two possibility. Choose this, get this feedback, or this feedback. So actually that is the, so the color represents the feedback, and the shape represents the action, and the, the both represent an event of interaction. So we are totally in the feedback loop uh, paradigm that uh, Robert Lagada uh, introduced on, on Wednesday. I think. But here we are a little bit more, uh, in fact in the example I am going to show you, we have three possibilities of action, two possibilities of feedback, and we have uh, values. So if I, if I obtain this interaction, it's positive. If I obtain this interaction, it's negative. But I don't know what that means. But you could think of the agent as if it liked to enact these interactions and disliked to enact these interactions. So in this demo, I am training this agent, this robot, to play, now I am going to train Poppy to play this little French song called In the Moonlight, which goes like that. Au clair de la lune, mon ami Pierrot. So this robot has only one bit of sensory information, whether it touches the drum or not. And it has three possible actions. Uh, touching this drum, this drum, or this drum. And just by removing the drum and putting the drum back, we can, tr because it doesn't like to miss the drum and it likes to hit the drum, so we can train it to perform a particular sequence. Um, and it's a bit challenging because uh, we don't say when the music begins and when the music ends. It has to learn uh, on, the, on the go. So I, because I am limited in time, uh, I have to, to jump to the end. Uh, so just by removing or putting the drum, we train it to enact a particular sequence. And after maybe a hundred of steps, between 100 and 200 of steps, it, it will learn. So for, for those who know this French song, you will recognize it, but I don't know if you know it. So the algorithm, how does it work? So we, we, we think in terms of those and interaction events that are here. And the algorithm learns sequence of interaction events in a hierarchical fashion. So it's a kind of hierarchical temporal memory. And then at a certain level, it looks if, whether it matched previously learned sequence. So here, this and this match this or this. So it will propose uh, this possibility or this possibility. And then we have a selection mechanism which chooses which, which we want to enact. Uh, so the selection, we can implement different criteria. 
if we, if, we, if we make the selection based on the value of the interaction, we have a purely hedonist robot that in this example, it will try to enact the interaction that he likes. But we can use different criteria. If, you, if we select an action that has not been tried before, uh, we have a curious robot because it will enact things that it has not tried before. And then when it has chosen this, this higher level sequence, it will enact it through, uh, against the real world. And if, if all goes well, it will, uh, so the, the decision uh, engage the agent for several cycles of interaction. So it's kind of, we call it a kind of basic self-programming because it, it learns a sequence of interaction that it can enact. Uh, and if it goes, goes, goes well, it can learn higher level sequence. The, I think the, it, this algorithm has some connection with uh, Brett Martensen's algorithm that he presented on uh, Wednesday. From that, we designed a cognitive architecture where there is this hierarchical sequence learning mechanism from the uh, interaction timeline. But there, are, there is also a spatial memory in which we can place the events of interaction in space here in the egocentric memory of the agents because the problem is not only to learn patterns in time but also patterns in space. Um, so we are working on it, and uh, you, you can see demos on, on our website if you want to learn more. Uh, also, uh, we thought it would be interesting to uh, create a kind of repository of atelic tasks. So if you think your algorithm can apply to an atelic task, uh, you could try our this little game that's a, a repository of atelic tasks, you, so you could try your algorithm against these tasks. Or if you have other atelic tasks that you want to study, we could include them in the game. Anyway, the game is free. You can download it on the App Store. If you have an iPhone or an iPad, I uh, encourage you to download it and play to understand better what I am saying. So as a conclusion, uh, there are a uh, lot of theoretical arguments to say that we should focus on atelic AI. For example, I can cite uh, Dreyfus here, who has been advocating for a Heideggerian approach to artificial intelligence. He said Heidegger's crucial insight is that being in the world is more basic than thinking on solving problems. That is, when we are coping our best, we are drawn in by affordances and respond directly to them. So we're not trying to solve a predefined problem, we're just responding to affordances and uh, constructing more and more complex affordances and so on. Uh, so I, I guess my main point is that I doubt that AGI can be achieved just by improving telic AI. I think we need more atelic studies, um, so that that's would be my claim today, but of course it's open to discussion. Uh, so when we do atelic AI, we do learning through experience of interaction, so there is no predefined set of states, the agent should learn its own states from its experience of interaction. Uh, it's uh, very li linked to intrinsic motivation, of course, because there is no extrinsic goal to reach. And uh, I think it's very connected to some alternative approaches to machine learning and AI, such as cybernetics, uh, which is not new, but Norbert Weiner argued for the idea that uh, uh, intelligence is about resisting perturbation, uh, so it's an atelic activity. Uh, also, I think theory of inaction, constructivist learning has some relation with that, and of course, developmental AI. And an interesting point with that is that we can study uh, atelic activity. Uh, there is no need for big data because the agent uh, finds, gets his data by interacting with the world. So even we are not, if we are not Facebook or Google, we can study uh, atelic learning. And we don't need also high computational power because apparently animals, even small animals, can learn atelic activity without high computer support. So it's a very stimulating uh, research for young researcher, and uh, I, my, the next presentation will be uh, my students who work on that. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Any questions? Yeah, okay. Okay. Don't you think that uh, this uh, action that you are calling atelic, uh, they couldn't be telic 
actions that can that were transformed into a habit. Yes. I mean, at, at the beginning they have this purpose uh, of, of reaching goals, but after you repeat it many times and it becomes so more uh, habit-like, okay. they they gain this uh, athletic uh, yeah, uh, characteristic because then you don't think anymore on the on the final state, but yeah. you just perform the action because. This proved to be interesting in the past. Thank you for asking. So, so just this remind me that I forgot to say something about this diagram. So the fact that there is no goal doesn't mean that there is no value. We need values to drive the learning, uh, like curiosity, like preference of interaction, things like that. But it's important to, for me. It's important to make the distinction between a goal and a value, and that's the whole debate. on the, yes, many many possibilities. Okay, very short uh, conceptual question about can we reach a real AGI without intrinsic motivation, without the uh, atelic uh, model of behavior? Can if we need only telic uh, model to AGI, or we, maybe we also need also atelic? Well, that's my point. Like, we need atelic. We need atelic. But on the last uh, slide, you show that uh, the only telic need to AGI. Did I make a mistake? No, I do. I looked that AGN can be, can be reached with TELIC. So I think it will require ATELIC, but most AI algorithms are TELIC, I think. So it's a call for more study of ATELIC uh, algorithms. Okay. okay, thank you.